Okay, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're joining us from the other side of the pond. Um, my name is Dr. Kate Quinn. I'm Associate Professor in Caribbean History at the Institute of the Americas and co-convener of the Caribbean Seminar Series. Uh, this is our first event of the 2022-2023 academic year, and it's a great honor <coughs> to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, <coughs> very familiar to many of us in this room. Professor Gad Human, who is both Honorary Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of the Americas, UCL, and also Professor Emeritus at the University of Warwick, where he served for a long time as <coughs> Director of the Centre for Caribbean Studies. Um, he's also co convener <coughs> of this, this seminar series, along with our colleague, Dr. Steve Cushion. Um, Professor Human is author of many works, including Between Black and White, Race, Politics and Free Colours in Jamaica, the now classic The Killing Time, The Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica, and The Caribbean, A Brief History. He has edited many volumes, um, including on slave resistance, on labour, <clears throat> on the history of slavery and the post-emancipation era. And he's the long-standing editor of the journal Slavery and Abolition. Um, he's also a friend to the Institute, to this series, and he's going to be speaking to us this afternoon on the apprenticeship system in the Caribbean, the world of the apprentices. So over to you, Gad. Well, thanks very much for that. Uh, it's good to see old friends and, of course, other people as well. So uh, um, let's see what you make of this. Slavery was abolished in the Anglophone Caribbean on August 1st, 1834. On that date, the enslaved became legally free. However, the freedom of the enslaved was he heavily circumscribed by the apprenticeship system, which followed immediately after August 1st. Under the terms of this system, former slaves were required to work up to 45 hours per week for their former masters without compensation. Apprenticeship was intended to last up to six years, depending on the category of the apprentice. The legislation meant that pradials, who were former field slaves, would serve a six-year term of apprenticeship, while non-pradials, largely former skilled slaves and domestics, would be apprenticed for four years. The historian Thomas Holt has called this system a halfway covenant, since apprentices were required to do compulsory labor for 45 hours per week, but were free to dispose of their labor outside of this time. The legislators in Britain who created this system envisioned it as a way to bridge the gap between slavery and freedom. They were worried about the immediate transition to full freedom for the enslaved. The legislation establishing apprenticeship also created specially appointed stipendary magistrates to oversee the system. They were given the role of adjudicating disputes between apprentices and their former masters. Appointed largely from Britain, stipendary magistrates were required to hold court once a week and to visit plantations with over 10 apprentices once every two weeks. In addition, the apprenticeship bill removed the power of corporal punishment from the former enslavers and transferred it to the stipendary magistrates. Apprentices had significant problems with this system. Many of them believed they were free and found it difficult to accept the continuation of compulsory labor. As, as a Wesleyan missionary in St. Kitts reported, there was a basic incongruity about apprenticeship. And here is his quote. It was difficult to make apprentices understand how they could be discharged of and from all manner of slavery and absolutely and forever manumitted, and yet to be compelled to work the greater part of their time for the same masters without adequate wages. Freedom and compulsory labor without payment and for no crime appeared to them incongruous. Like the enslaved, Apprentices have left very little direct evidence in the form of letters or diaries. But because of their appearances before the stipendary magistrates and in the reports generated about the apprenticeship system, 
we can recreate aspects of their world and understand how apprentices sought to use apprentice, apprenticeship to improve their lives. <clears throat> Even before the onset of, of apprenticeship, there were early signs of trouble. In St. Kitts, for example, the enslaved indicated that they would resist apprenticeship and would strike on August the 1st, 1834. In Jamaica, the situation was also difficult. So if we look at the map, you can see uh, St. Kitts in the Western Caribbean and Jamaica just below Cuba in the Eastern Caribbean. In the parish of St. Anne in Jamaica, apprentices went on strike, vowing not to work except for wages. As in other parts of the Caribbean, apprentices questioned whether the king could be responsible for the legislation or whether instead it emanated from Jamaica. They asked the authorities a series of what I think rather telling questions. Is it the king's law? Would you swear that the king make it? Did not the Jamaica House make it, meaning the House of Assembly in Jamaica? Did not Lord Sligo, the governor of Jamaica, put him name to it because him have slaves? Could you swear it is the law of Jesus Christ? Apprentices therefore resisted the system at its outset. Subsequently, they attempted to assert their rights as much as possible during the apprenticeship period, even in the face of a highly oppressive system. In addition, there was another level of protest that was more generalized and more difficult to control. The anthropologist James Scott has described this behavior of peasants in terms of hidden transcripts, using foot dragging or poaching as part of an everyday form of resistance. Apprentices in Jamaica employed such tactics. Governor Sligo commented on the reaction of many apprentices who were unhappy with the new system. They resorted in his terms to turning out late, irregularity to work and idling of time. To some degree, these so-called delinquencies were dealt with by the special magistrates, but there was the additional problem of what planters perceived as insolence and insubordination. So the reaction of the apprentices in the first year of, of apprenticeship was highly revealing. It was clear that their image of freedom differed substantially from those of the policymakers in the colonial office, as well as their former masters. For the apprentices, and especially those who resisted the establishment of apprenticeship, it was difficult to comprehend the new system. The apprentices felt they needed no apprenticeship, they needed no training for freedom or for their work on the plantations. In fact, the nature of the slave's own economy in the Caribbean, with its extensive provision ground system and highly developed markets, meant that the enslaved were probably better prepared for freedom than their former masters. At the onset of apprenticeship, ex-slaves wanted to be fully free. As the historian Woodville Marshall has suggested, they sought to take full control of their labor time and of their own lives. Moreover, it was important for them to reconstitute their families and practice their religions. Apprentices therefore sought unrestricted freedom and not a system of forced labor for even part of the week. In addition to the problem of compulsory labor, apprentices faced huge obstacles in a system that was heavily weighted in favor of the planters. A stipendiary magistrate in Jamaica, Edward Dakers Baines, blamed the planters for their often harsh treatment of the apprentices. Baines pointed to the overwhelming advantages of apprenticeship for the planters, especially the six years of forced labor and the compensation money paid by the British government to the owners of enslaved labor. In his report, Baines detailed some of the difficulties the apprentices had to confront. Many planters stopped providing the food allowances they had customarily given to the enslaved and organized the apprentices' work time so they did not have half, a half day on Fridays to cultivate their provision grounds. For Baines, this put the apprentices, quote, as regards time, and the means of subsist subsistence in a worse condition than when they were slaves. 
Even more serious was the practice of local magistrates, often planters themselves, of illegally confining apprentices to the houses of correction across the island. Although planters no longer had the power of corporal punishment, local magistrates could order the flogging and punishment of apprentices in those houses of correction without an appeal to the stipendary magistrates. The law also stipulated harsh penalties for offenses committed by apprentices. For example, indolence and carelessness at work was punishable by, punishable by 15 hours of additional labor. For further offenses, the punishments included flogging and hard labor. In addition, the treadmill, an instrument designed to mete out justice, was often used by local magistrates as a means of torture, with apprentices forced to endure brutal flogging while on the treadmill. And here is a, an image of the, uh, the notorious treadmill, and you can see apprentices being flogged um, and other brutality going on in this situation. Yet despite these abuses, apprenticeship had advantages for the apprentices, and they were well aware of the significance of their changed status. As one stipendary magistrate, one stipendary magistrate reported in Jamaica nearly two years after the start of the apprenticeship system, apprentices, quote, feel themselves possessed of the rights and privileges of free men. This was reflected in the language of the apprentices. As Edward Dakers Baines noted, quote, the apprentice, the apprentice is daily becoming more heedless of and more disrespectful to his manager. For example, a plantation constable complained in 1837 that, a, that an apprentice named Walter Taylor was not doing his work. The constable warned Taylor not to give him any jaw, jaw was a verbal retort, not to give him any jaw, but Taylor responded, quote, who are you? Are you the Lord Jesus Christ? that I'm not to give you any jaw? In St. Kitts, the manager of Spooner Estate, Murdoch McLeod, complained that the driver, Frederick, was drunk and unable to do his job. McLeod asked Frederick, quote, what was the matter with your eyes? They look red. To which Frederick, remember the apprentice, replied, yours look rather blue. The stipendary magistrate, Ralph Cleghorn, confirmed that Frederick was drunk and sentenced him to receive 12 stripes. On another estate in St. Kitts, the manager brought a complaint against several women, including Rachel, for riotous conduct and behaving insolently to the auxiliary constable, whose name was Hamlet. According to Hamlet, Rachel was examining a bird's nest instead of doing her work. When Hamlet told her to get back to work, Rachel replied, oh, don't bother me. Elsewhere in St. Kitts, an apprentice named Henry claimed he was sick and unable to work. When the manager of the estate ordered Henry to go to the sick house on the estate, Henry demonstrated an understanding of the law by pointing out that, he that that was all the manager could do to him. And once inside the sick house, Henry told the manager that, quote, he was no Congo boy to be treated in that way. He was a man like myself, and he would, be, he would be damned if he'd be treated in that way. The stipendium magistrate admonished Henry and dismissed the case. Apprentices did not just respond verbally to their former masters. They also lodged many complaints against them with the stipendium magistrates. As the stipendium magistrate in Jamaica noted in 1835, the apprentices, quote, are themselves so tenacious of their newly acquired privileges that they take a special care to prefer complaints whenever they have occasion to do so. For example, three apprentices on Mount Vernon Estate in Jamaica complained to stipendium magistrate Frederick White that their master was overworking them, as they called it. White upheld their complaint and ordered that they be given extra free time as a result. 
When apprentices on another estate in Jamaica told White that their master was not providing the necessities of life, White admonished the planter and threatened to impose the heaviest fine possible if things did not improve. The most common complaint was assault against apprentices, including minor infractions. For example, an, an apprentice named Hannibal complained that the overseer of an estate in St. Kitts threw a potato at him, removed a protective covering over his eye, and called him an old villain. Stepenter Magistrate Cleghorn found the overseer guilty of an assault and fined him 10 shillings. Apprentices also complained about improper confinement in the stocks and having to work beyond the allotted time without payment. In a case in British Guyana, the apprentices on Cove Estate complained about receiving insufficient clothing and also about the state of their homes. In response, the stipendary magistrate, K. Helen, reported that, quote, steps had been taken to make up the deficiency forthwith, and he had allowed 14 days for the problem of the clothing to be dealt with. Helen also noted that he had given the manager a month to improve the houses of the apprentices and that significantly the apprentices were satisfied with these arrangements. Apprentices also complained about the system of classification that divided them as predials and non-predials. At the outset of the apprenticeship system, former masters were required to put their apprentices in either category. Most appear to have done so without consulting the apprentices themselves. Listing skilled and domestic slaves as predials meant that the apprentice, apprentices would be obliged to serve an extra two years as apprentices. Many, many apprentices across the Caribbean were aware of their rights and, and of the possibility of appealing against their categorization. The governor of Barbados reported in the spring of 1838 that there were a considerable number of, of apprentices in the process of challenging their categorization. The number of appeals on this issue reinforced the governor's view. In the three month period from December 1837 to March 1838, there, almost, there were almost 500 appeals of this kind, nearly 300 of which had been successful. And here is the, the table which gives you that information. And you can see that. Uh, the breakdown in terms of uh, gender and the number, the overwhelming number of females who were success, successful in appealing against their classification. Going back to the summer of 1837, the figure was even more impressive. 877 appeals, of which nearly 570 had been successful. Female apprentices were at the forefront of resistance to apprenticeship generally. In a letter to the colonial secretary, Governor Sligo included a report from a stipendary magistrate in Jamaica who concluded that, quote, the women are on all occasions the most clamorous, the most troublesome and insubordinate and least respectful of, of all authority. Echoing this view, stipendary magistrate Frederick White reported on the case of three women who were charged with insolence and refusing to work and otherwise bad disposed people, exciting the rest of the women to rebel. Those are of course his terms. In St. Kitts, the manager of an estate complained about four women who were repeatedly late for work. Three of them apologized, but one of the women, Nanny, not only denied the charge, but also quote, declares her determination not to abide by any regulations or requests. According to Stipendi Magistrate Ralph Cleghorn, Nanny, quote, manifests a decided spirit of opposition and a habitual pattern of, quote, pertinacious conduct. Similarly, Betsy Williams, who was an apprentice on Hope Estate in St. Kitts, refused to go to work and told the manager of the estate that he would have to carry her to the field. A constable was sent to persuade her to return to her job as a cane cutter and threatened to take her to the sick house, but she refused. In sentencing Betsy Williams to 10 days work for the estate in her own time, Stipendry Magistrate Cleghorn described her character as, quote, violent and unruly, and noted 
that she shows a great disposition to disobey orders. Cleghorn also dealt with a case in which several women in a weeding gang refused to follow the orders of the driver each, to each take a row. According to the driver, they chose their own rows, and when he ordered them to begin weeding, they called out in a most riotous manner, hola, hola, resisted his authority and abused him. The manager of the estate claimed he had never heard such a racket in his life. This flouting of authority was not limited to adult female apprentices. On another estate in St. Kitts, the driver of the second gang complained that a group of five girls, ranging in ages from eight to 16 years old, were impudent and negligent in their work, and sometimes, quote, stand up and laugh at him. The actions of the female apprentice, apprentices could also be dramatic. On the Kitty Plantation in Demerara, about 25 women apprentices sought to rescue men on the plantation who had been convicted of not performing their work and sentenced to be whipped. So women resisted apprenticeship, but they, like male apprentices, also sought to be manumitted. The Abolition Act stip stipulated that apprentices had the right to buy themselves out of apprenticeship. However, the provisions of the act made this difficult. Apprentices were to be valued by three magistrates, only one of whom was a stipendiary magistrate. The other two were colonial magistrates, men, of course men, who often had apprentices themselves. The colonial magistrates frequently put very high valuations on the apprentices, overruling the stipendiary magistrates and making it difficult for apprentices to purchase their freedom. Despite these high costs, a significant number of apprentices were able to purchase their manumission. So in this, in the following table, in this table, it is possible to get a sense of the type of apprentices most likely to be manumitted. So you can see that there were considerably more females than males and more non pradials skilled slaves, than pradials. And the numbers are quite overwhelming in this case. Neither of these figures is surprising, especially considering the preponderance of females as domestics among the apprentice population. The total number of manumitted apprentices for 1837, as you can see, almost 1,200 was, I think, quite significant. There was a very revealing report from St. Vincent in early 1838 that the non pradials were anxious to be manumitted even at that late date, because they wanted to purchase their own manumission and not, as they call it, be indebted to the law. This was even more the case once the legislation ending the apprenticeship had been enacted. One stipendiary magistrate in St. Vincent reported that apprentices clearly did not want to become manumitted by the general legislation. They did not want to be, as they called it, quote, a Queen Adelaide's man that is free by the operation of the law, or as they say, quote, that Bakra, white man, may change his mind again and make the apprenticeship longer. Apprenticeship did come to an end for all apprentices in 1838. Yet even before it ended, there were, there were reports of improvements in the apprentice population. There were more marriages among the apprentices and more of them were being educated. Stipendiary magistrates reported on the general improvement in the social condition of apprentices. And one magistrate contrasted the difference between the enslaved and the apprentices. Quote, the apprentice does not now consider himself that degraded being he did in the time of slavery and has wonderfully improved in appearance and health. So let me uh, move towards a conclusion. In the face of a highly oppressive system, apprentices initially resisted apprenticeship and like apprentices in a similar system in Cuba 50 years later, subsequently sought to use it to their own advantage. Apprentices saw positive changes in their lives. A significant number were manumitted and others had their classification changed to ensure their early freedom. The power of corporal punishment was removed from their enslavers and apprentices were able to bring their former masters before the stipendiary magistrates' courts. 
In those courts, apprentices could be treated harshly, but, the, but they also found protection in ways that were very different from their experiences during slavery. For example, the manager of an estate in St. Kitts complained that his apprentice named Margaret refused to dig holes for potatoes. But Margaret claimed before Stipendium Magistrate Cleghorn that she was unable to do this work and produced a medical certificate confirming she was exempt from holing. As a result, the manager withdrew the complaint. In another case in St. Kitts, an apprentice named Priscilla complained that the manager of an estate had killed her sheep during martial law on the island. That was at the outset of the apprenticeship system. After a witness confirmed that this had happened, Cleghorn, the stipendium magistrate, ordered the manager to pay Priscilla for the sheep. Cleghorn also ruled that Prince, an apprentice who normally worked as a doctor uh, on an estate in St. Kitts, should not be forced to work as a field laborer. Prince maintained that he had never worked in the field uh, and, and a constable on the estate corroborated Prince's story. For Cleghorn, Prince's role as a sick nurse was his what he called natural avocation and countermanded the estate manager's attempt to effectively demote him. In addition, governors sometimes intervened to protect apprentices. For example, when a purchaser of an estate in Jamaica sought to transfer the apprentices elsewhere, Sligo insisted that this would be against the law if it was, quote, injurious to the health and welfare of the apprentices. Apprenticeship also allowed apprentices to respond to demands they believed were inappropriate. An overseer on an estate in St. Kitts complained that, that only 27 of the cutting gang had turned out when it should have been 35 and asked the driver to select apprentices who could work an individual row. When the driver ordered several apprentices to do this, quote, they refused, threw down their hose, clapped their hands, made a great noise, declaring they would not carry a row. One of the apprentices, Jenny, claimed that her former master had never given her a row to do by herself, while another apprentice, Esther, said that she was working with a borrowed hoe and as a result would continue to work in a row with another person. A third apprentice, Glasgow, made it clear that he would only work a row by himself if every other apprentice had to do so as well. These apprentices had an understanding of what they believed were excessive demands and refused to accede to them. But there was a price to pay. Cleghorn ordered, Cleghorn ordered the apprentices to work for seven and a half hours for the estate on their own time the following Saturday. Because of the apprenticeship system, however, apprentices could articulate their grievances in ways that were generally not possible during slavery and that would have resulted in far more severe punishments. There was a further advantage for apprentices. As the stipendium magistrate John Anderson noted in his journal, apprentices were able to, to use uh, or to control, sorry, to use their, some of their free time for the things that mattered to them, such as family, community, religion, and recreation. As the stipendium magistrate concluded, apprenticeship was not what apprentices expected or wanted, but quote, it is at least a protective one to him and that by good behavior, he has the power of securing himself from the aggression of the tyrannical or the persecution of the vindictive. Thank you very much.